Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 259. That's 259. How you guys doing? How you guys feeling? Great, awesome. Hope you guys are well, hydrated and rested. I'm back from a very long weekend. Thank you for being patient and waiting for me to come back. For those of you that don't care and just popped up now, thank you anyway. Regardless, I appreciate it. Um, it's been a long one, man. It's been a long three-day recovery weekend. Or maybe not even four, five, four days? Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Four-day recovery session. Four-day recovery session, which I'll get into a little bit later. But hope you guys are doing okay. It's now sometime in Wednesday morning. I'm here sat somewhere in East London talking to you via YouTube, talking to you via the podcast app. As per usual, if you're watching via YouTube and you like what I'm doing, please give me a little thumbs up, subscribe to the video if you want to see some more, check out my playlist, I post clips and all that stuff on my channel. If you're listening via the podcast app, why not leave a five-star review so people can find the show, right? So there are people can discover it, you can tell them how funny I am, how interesting I am, how introspective I am, how shite I am, if you, if you may, whatever it may be, spread it far and wide and let me know what you think. So, as I mentioned, it's been a four, four, four-day recovery session, four days, mofos, four days. And if you're wondering why, you're like, Agostino, what happened to you in four days? Why have you been so um, gnarly? Why are you still recovering? Why is your body all ravaged? What's happening? What's wrong? Are you okay? Are you okay? Yes, friends, I'm okay. But I've been ravaged. I cannot um, deny that. As you can tell also, if you're watching the YouTube video, I'm trying to grow my beard. I'm trying to grow my beard. Um, I'm, I, I, I might do that thing where, like, you know, people are preparing for an album. I think Jay-Z maybe popularized, popularized it when he was... Um, doing his albums he'd always let his hair grow his hair grow out so um i might do the same thing too with me uh, uh with my kind of weight loss stuff i'm trying to do and the kind of body composition i want to get to i might just let my hair grow until i get to the size i want to get to and then kind of cut it off but this is what i'm going with i've got my beard all growing out here but i've got some gaps on, on the size that i need to kind of get right but you know that will come later but yeah i'm kind of growing out my beard kind of trying to grow out my hair and maybe I might even go at the back and kind of do a little bit of a mohawk, a little bit of a Neymar mohawk going on in the next few weeks. So if you're wondering why I look so rough, it's on purpose. I have money to cut my hair, but, you know, I choose not to right now because I have other um, I have other obligations, you know, and also how my bank account is set up. It doesn't allow me to do haircuts during the week. You know what I mean? I've got to do them later on during the end of the month when that whole salary comes in. But now I feel like I'm going to let it grow out. I mean, it probably won't last long because whenever I wake up and I and I look too rough, I end up just getting a haircut because I just can't handle it anymore. And there's something about having hair this big and allowing it to grow this unruly. You tend to not have many outfits to wear. I don't really have many avenues to go down. So the haircuts kind of like assist you in that respect because it kind of gets, you know, I don't know how to describe it. When you, you Anyone that's got an afro will know. Your afro kind of impedes your, your kind of outfits. It kind of makes you, you kind of... um. And after some time, especially if it's unruly and it's not been kept well, and it hasn't been moisture, like, you know, mine's a bit, you know, nappy and it's a bit, you know, doesn't look the, the most healthiest. It tends to kind of downgrade your actual clothes. Um, obviously, there's ways to do it properly, but that takes a lot of effort. And most guys, guys like myself, don't want to do the effort, right? So um, that's why it doesn't work out too well. But hey, we're here now. Let's talk in more podding. So if you're wondering why I've, I'm still recovering, last or, yeah, last, last Saturday... I went to Mixed Garage to the Tricks um, night. Well, I think I don't think it was his debut show in London. I think he's played before in London. But Tricks from Innovision, one of the newest signees, came and played uh, down at uh, at Mixed Garage, one of my favorite venues in East London. And it was probably one of my favorite club nights. Probably one of my most favorite club nights I've been to in a long time. Maybe in, maybe in a year. I think the anticipation obviously added to the whole event. I'm going to get it up on here so you guys can see. The anticipation probably added to the whole hype of the event, right? I was anticipating it for a while. Really looking forward to hearing someone from Innovision play at a place like Mix, a venue that I've kind of been to, you know, numerous times. You can see the post on my... Um, I've got various videos on this channel kind of describing my the times I've been there to see, you know, Dr. Rubenstein and a few other people play there. It's always been a really stellar time. But obviously, Tricks was somebody that I've been kind of curious about. Um, a friend and I kind of are big Innovision fanboys. We're a big fan of the label, a big fan of what they kind of do, big fan of Dixon, big fan of Arm. Um, you know, the whole gang we kind of root for. And um, Tricks has kind of been somebody we kind of stumbled upon. I'm going to say mainly because of I'm to Dixon. 
um, which is an Instagram page that I really recommend you guys check out. It's a really cool, like a fan page that essentially puts um, anything concerning Innovision is basically plopped on there. And I really recommend you check it out. Let me get up in the screen so you guys can see it. I think I, I discovered him through there. Pretty sure. Someone posted a clip of Tricks playing maybe at an Innovision label night or a Dixon set playing back to back or something. And then from there, I kind of showed my friend and we kind of, you know, discovered him and tried to go through his sets, find some productions here and there, some edits, whatever they may be. And then, of course, once you see the videos of him playing um, back to back or with or alongside in a vision, it all starts to make sense, right? They're very particular aesthetic. For the most part, they're all very much into designer clothing and all that sort of stuff. They play the same sort of kind of music, a lot of really cool indie dance edits, a lot of cool, um, I'm not, I don't know how you call it, atmospheric house or whatever you maybe call that sound, but it's a particular sound that they play similar to what Solomon would play, like the perfect sort of set you would hear maybe at IB for after hours, right? When the sun is setting, um, you got your hands in the air, smoking a cigarette, you don't even smoke, surrounded by your best friends, chilling. That's the kind of best music they play. But they're also very versatile that they can play in like a really, you know, small, uh, dark club somewhere in the depths of East London and still tear it to pieces. That's why I think their versatility, their versatility comes into play. So this is the Instagram page that I found them on, arm to dixon um, So it's A-M-E-2 Dixon on Instagram. They post loads of Innovision um, centric stuff. I think you've got a video here of Tricks actually playing somewhere. This is a club called Vault in Milan, it looks like. Right, absolutely doing the thing. So they've got loads of loads of videos here. There's a video here of Dixon obviously playing. You can tell straight away it's here. Stands and stuff, and you've got another video here of Dixon playing again in Madrid. So you can kind of check it out. So I kind of got uh, this. This is basically effectively where I found out about tricks. So we bought tickets a while back. Really much looking forward to it. And again, I think because of my for because of the sober October stuff, I've kind of been a little bit. My tolerance has gone completely low when it comes to you know getting on it and being outside and having a bit of fun. So I I think. I was looking forward to it, but I was also a bit nervous about how I would um, sustain myself throughout the entire night. And if this is any indication of how the Innovision London label night is going to go, I'm probably going to need to do a lot of work internally to make sure I survive. So we get there about half 11. Um, we walk base we effectively get the train from Stratford to Hackney Wick and then pop down there. And there's kind of hardly any queues to go inside mix. Mixed security staff are fairly um, cause on the outside. No intense fire searching. They're not, not going to stick a finger up your ass or anything. So that's that works out pretty well. Um, get inside. Little queue to kind of scan your tickets. Some the ladies at the front, and then you sort of effectively walk straight into the party. And if you've not been to mix before, you would know that if you've not been to mix before, the layout is essentially like a big warehouse. I think they usually store beer kegs and stuff in there from for the crate brewery, or they have their own brewery in there that they kind of and i'm not too sure but i'm pretty sure they they hold beer kegs in there towards the behind basically be behind the dj booths so we're in there um music is going off and i think once we walk in i think that's when solar's playing because i think tricks played from 12 to 4 i'm pretty sure he had a four hour set um and solar was banging for the for the half an hour we heard him i've never heard of who solar is i'm not really very familiar with solar uh, beforehand but having spoke to a couple of people who were in the party um talking to us and kind of you know uh, you know sharing our love of uh innovision solar is very much highly regarded around amongst people and according to ra solar from the united states it says here he's also part one part of sunset sound system and he also has a RA resident advisor mix number 459, it looks like. And obviously he plays, you know, at loads of other places too. So he's fairly on his way up too. I'm not sure if he's associated with Innovision loosely, if he signed on to them or if he produces with them or if he's just like a friend of the fam, a friend of the label. But regardless, he really did. He really played well. And I think it's... um. um I think it needs to be noted because I've long believed, I think we've kind of said it before, me and my friend, like, because I've got a couple of playlists online where, you know, people post up tune IDs of stuff they hear in the Vision DJs play. And I've always kind of been resist, hesitant or resistant to kind of like go and get those tunes myself and play them in my own DJ sets because I always get the impression that the Innovision sound is very hard to play without sounding like an Innovision copycat. The, the, even the, like there's stuff that you hear them play that only they could play in their sets i don't know how if you if it makes any sense to you guys but it's very hard to kind of uh take those songs and kind of make them work in your own set because naturally you're going to want to try and mix them the way they mix them you're going to try and make them sound sonically the way they the way it sounds sonically with them you're going to want to pitch it up or pitch down the way they do it there's certain things that just call for it because the reason why those songs sound good 
on their set list is because they've done those edits or they've made those adjustments that you've heard. So it's kind of hard to kind of, you know, um, take, it's kind of hard. I, I always imagined that it'd be kind of hard to play back to back with anyone from Indivision because they're so, they've got such a unique lasered in sound. It's hard to kind of, I don't know. It's probably easier for them to play back to back with anybody else, but it, it's not, it's probably harder the other way around. I would assume so. But Solar did really well. He really sounded different from anyone else I've heard in Indivision or associated with them, but still sounded within their pocket. Still had that similar sound in their pocket. And then, of course, the main man rocked up at about 12. By that time, we had a few drinks. We'd been dancing, uh, chilling out. And I have to say, that was probably one of the most funnest crowds I've kind of been um, around in uh, in Mix. For the most part, Mix Garage is pretty good good venue, I would say. Um, everyone's really chill. Everyone's got really good banter. Um, Everyone just doesn't take themselves too seriously. Everyone's dancing as well. It's probably one of the rare venues in London where people are really packed up at the front in front of the DJ booth trying to, you know, throwing up signs, dancing, doing their thing. Hardly anyone being annoying and sticking a camera in the DJ's face. People are quite respectable in that regard. Um, and yeah, we just had loads of good crack, met loads of interesting people, met a lady that was um, supposedly involved with Innovision Label in terms of helping them tour. We met Trix's brother. We met a couple other dudes who are really cool and really loved them, Innovision too. So loads of kind of fanboys and fangirls around just kind of, you know, celebrating this occasion. And of course, the main man rocks up. And um, I think... Firstly, in terms of aesthetic wise, I'm pretty sure he was wearing a Dries Van Noten shirt, the one with the sort of like swells on it. I'm pretty sure it was that, or it might have been um, what is what's the other brand? I'm pretty sure it's Dries Van Noten. It's got the little kind of paint brushes on it. I'm pretty sure it's Dries Van Noten. Should, should I check here and see if it was Dries? Yeah, let me check. Why not? It's a podcast, and so it makes it more interesting. Let me see if I can find it. I'm pretty sure it's a Dries Van Noten shirt. Dries Van Noten. This is this is really important because the DJ set, but you know, it adds to the actual effect of things. Yeah, so I think it was one of these shirts. Let me see if I can find it. It's got the little swells on it, right? Um, ba 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 ba. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, this one. I'm pretty sure it's something similar to this. I'm pretty sure. So, Dream Development with the print on it with the kind of swells. I'm pretty sure, but it was cut really short. It had a really interesting cut. It was sort of cut similar to like a Prada shirt, but even more. I think it was even shorter than. Oh, sorry, police cars going by. I think the shirt was even shorter than the actual. Um, Prada shirt and a bit more of a boxier fit so it came up basically just above his navel um, with some interest I think he had some um, Issy Mackie pants on I'm not too sure if they were Issy Mackie as well but anyway he did the damn thing came on he had a rotary mixer and just absolutely tore it to pieces um, and again just levels man absolute levels um, it's it's always um, it's always sobering and always um, motivating and inspiring to be somewhere sobering and inspiring yeah, it's it's always it's always very sobering, I'd say, and inspiring to be somewhere like a to be at a yeah, it's always sobering and inspiring to be at to be at a flipping to be at a place like that and to see someone like a tricks at that level playing because you're like, okay, cool, these are the levels, right? Um, I'm pretty sure he's probably younger than I am. Maybe he started later. I'm not too sure. Whatever it may be, but there is obviously I can obviously tell because I remember. When we were when we found out about Tricks beforehand through Arm to Arm or Arm to Dixon, sorry, we found out about him. I do remember um, going on his kind of SoundCloud or something and finding some mixes of his, right, and hearing them, and they were decent, right? They were, they were fairly good mixes, but nothing to shout home about, like just you know fairly decent mixes. But I'm pretty sure this whole summer that he spent touring with Indivision, playing back to back with Arm, playing back to back with Dixon, playing back to back with, you know. I don't know. Whoever else they may play with. Maybe he did this. He went and played with Solomon, uh, DC 10, all these other events that he played at, right? I'm pretty sure those events have kind of leveled him up to an insane level. I'm pretty sure if you probably asked him, he'd probably say, yeah, I'm a far better DJ now than he probably was at the beginning of the year. And it really goes back to the adage of like, iron sharpens iron. I'm, I'm in no doubt that once you're surrounded by those kind of people, you're surrounded by that kind of level of commitment, determination. You've got someone like a Dixon or an arm who, you know, two adult dudes who have their own families but are super hardworking. They're plucking tunes out from everywhere. They're listening to them. They're listening to demos. They're doing edits. They're constantly on the phone, tweaking performances, tweaking the sound, just being hardworking, guys. I'm pretty sure being that young, it would inspire you to just level up your game. And then once you come back to London and you come play at a small 500 capacity club in the middle of East London, you're going to tear it to pieces. It's just not fair. And that's what it felt like. It felt like it, would, it just wasn't a fair set. Like he was absolutely shelling, like, like, and again, it was a, it was an expert set that it was so, it was a kind of set that was so good that you, I kind of felt, I kind of um, didn't want to go to the toilet. I was kind of rushing, running back to a dance floor every time he was playing. I, I didn't want to 
I didn't want to leave the dance floor too long, and we stayed right until the end. It was just an epic, 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 epic set, man. Like the sound, everything, the 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 visual. Sorry, the 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 lighting guy at the top was absolutely killing it too. Um, that was really cool. I love I love the light show that they put on behind it. Whoever invested that money in it, I'm not sure if it's something that makes do themselves or if it's something the promoter has to do on their own. But that was awesome. Um, yeah, just everything about it was flipping cool. And honestly, it was lit. It was, and I think part of the reason why it was so good was because the crowd was amazing. They like I've always maintained, you know, maybe sixty percent or maybe even seventy percent of a club night is, um, you know, relies heavily on the people that actually go to the clubs. I think that's a, probably the main reason why a place like I don't know, um, uh, what, what what do they call that place in Pippin Dawson? Damn it. The Dawson Kings and the the kind of queer club just above. It's got the dancers and upstairs. I've got I've got the name of it, but that's one of the clubs there. I still think is you know has got quite a big pool. People still go there every week. There's places like that in London that exist because obviously there's not many because most of the you know smaller clubs have shut down. We've only left with kind of mega clubs. But some of the smaller venues, some of the smaller capacity venues in London. The only way they can survive and actually thrive and actually, you know, have a good atmosphere is if they have the right amount of people in there or the, the right type of people in there. And it's quite hard to do it nowadays because, you know, people age out. People age out of clubs. People move away. People end up kind of raising families. People just get disinterested with the scene. So you have a whole new gaggle of people coming in, right? And it's hard to kind of cultivate a scene when people are just changing, you know, every four years or so. But I think what Mix does a good thing of is that, firstly, probably... They probably have a high threshold or they probably have a high a really long criteria in terms of who the promoters are in terms of who, the, who can come in and do a show there they probably have to you know could we have to kind of jump through a lot of hoops to kind of get a show on there in the first place and the people that are putting shows on there judging by the past performances you kind of have to bring it you can't get away with just booking like a regular schmegular you know lowest hanging fruit person if you want to make that thing work and plus because of mixes mix garages location you know it's not necessarily on a busy high street it's in the middle of Hackney Wick. Um, you have to know it to know it kind of thing. If you haven't been to the crate or you haven't been to Yard, you probably won't know it exists. Um, and again, it's a bit out of the it's a bit out of it's a bit out of the way for some people, depending. But not probably not for a lot, but you know, you still have to maybe get an Uber home, two buses home. It's not it's a bit of effort that's required. So you really have to ace the the promotion beforehand, marketing it, and also maybe the lineup so people can actually go to their destination to go. And I think the timing of that place works really well too because I think it's open from like 10 to 4 for the most part. So those are the perfect um, window to kind of get to a place like Hackney Wick because you'd want to get there before 12 so you can get the train. You don't want to get there. Yeah, you, you wouldn't want to get to mix um, outside of the train window, right? Because it'd just be a hassle to get there. So you want to get there before the train gets there and also you want to leave before, you know, the sun rises and shit. So it's the perfect amount of time to get there. And again, the club is probably you know layout wise really cool just one big square they've got like little mezzanine 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 place thing at the top whatever balcony whatever you call it um which was incredibly warm i'm not sure why it was so warm up there but it was that's where the the lighting dude was doing his damn thing but it was too warm to stay up there for the most part people were going up there then they've obviously got the smoking there on the outside and the little alleyway just be just to, to the side of the club uh but the main action is in the front and then you know behind the gate where the dj is probably to his left um, is a kind of I don't know, quote unquote VIP bit that people were kind of popping in and popping out of. But again, usually that spot would be reserved for all the wankers and stuff. But everyone was cool. The VIP people that were standing there were cool. All the industry peeps I met were safe. The bartenders were safe. The security guards were safe. It was just a really safe environment. The people at the cloakroom were safe. It was just a really cool environment. I fucking loved it, man. Honestly, easily one of my best nights I've had in London for a while. Um, again, Tricks actually smashed it. Solar again. I've, you know, you've, you've got a brand new fan in me. I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on him and seeing what he does. And again, um, I really recommend you check out Innovision. Um, the next night we're going to go to probably is the in no definitely going to is the Innovision label night in London and Fold. That's happening in a couple of weeks, so definitely check that out if you haven't checked it out already. I'm pretty sure tickets are sold out for that one, but just keep an eye out on Ticket Swap. Keep an eye out on the Facebook group. You probably might be able to get a ticket um, last minute. There's always people that drop out, always people that, you know, I can't go now or something come up. Or something always has to come up, right? Usually people that are just trying to resell and didn't be able to get any money for it, but I really recommend you get a ticket to see these guys play because it's it's really different. I think sometimes it's different. You kind of get a bit jaded when you go to these kind of events. You kind of feel like you've seen everything. There's nothing new under the sun. But I think sometimes the ability to see a DJ of this level of proficiency, especially somebody that young in trick, to be to to see him shelling that well, and and again, I heard I heard his sets before 
I knew I heard his sets prior to this event, right? So in the beginning of the year, the beginning of the summer, and you can honestly tell the four months that I've kind of he's kind of been away touring, living the lavish life, he has improved tenfold. And again, iron sharpens iron. There's no doubt about it. So if ever there was a case for smaller DJs feeling as if they haven't got a looking and then you know we're not getting the chance that we need, I think you have to respect that. Sometimes there are just people that are just much better at this DJ thing than you. Um, they're just levels and levels above what we're doing at the moment. And sometimes as well, it's very important to somehow, I'm not sure how it's possible to do, but if you're an upcoming DJ, it might be important. It might be a good way to kind of get better is to maybe get friendly with promoters and kind of volunteer your warm up DJ, um, uh, your warm up DJ services for free. Like I would be, I'll, I think I'd be willing to do that more than happy to go and warm up DJ for a big person for free just so i can have the the ability to like stand behind the decks and watch them do what they do you know see them beforehand maybe when they go for dinner with a promoter see how they kind of carry themselves all that all those things kind of really add to kind of uh, is number one kind of making you back come, like, you know, the, the day after the tricks event i came back and you know i, I probably made two mixes that i haven't uploaded yet but I just came back and started downloading songs, buying stuff. Like, I was just super inspired. So I can only imagine what it must do to you when you're hanging around that kind of level of caliber of DJ, flying around with them, hearing them talk about the industry, hearing them talk about electronic music, hearing them talk about dance music culture, hearing them just, you know, just being gross in a scene. It's only going to rub off on you. Um, and I can imagine that could be, that's probably leaps and bounds different level to kind of, you know, hanging around people in the kind of open deck scene who are just complaining about 100 quid they haven't received from a shaggy promoter. It's not necessarily the most inspiring place to be. So I think it has to be an understanding that as much as it is important to kind of hustle on a ground level, you really have to put yourself in the mixer and surround yourself with these elite people. But again, like I said, um, mix is my favorite venue. Um, they smashed it. Uh, this promoter that put it on, who are they? Uh, Tricks Correct. Okay, it was actually his label now, I'm assuming. Larry who? What does it say here? Labyrinth. Uh, Labyrinth Promotions at Mixed Garage. Again, an amazing night. Tricks and Solar, back to back. Absolutely killed it. Solar, I'm guessing for two hours. Tricks for four hours. Absolutely disgusting, dirty, um, dance-filled, sweaty occasion. Oh, actually, the sweat too. Um, I think they've improved the aircon. I'm going to say that. They've improved the aircon. Mix was cool as hell. Like, the last time I went there, which was... No, one of the most sweatiest times I went was when I went to go to pussy palace i went to pussy palace at, at, at mix for probably like three or four times in a row and it was so sweaty it was just insane like my t-shirt was dripping um i literally had to kind of ring dry it in the toilet a couple times which is you know it's super nasty i know if you're eating and you're drinking something i apologize but that's the truth so um yeah we, we, they've improved the air conditioning it's a bit hot up top but you know you gotta do what you have to do so i really recommend you check out mix one of my favorite venues in london tricks again one of my one of my favorite djs now a new favorite and solar i've got two new favorite guys that i'm kind of following at the moment and individual label night coming up at fold very very soon so make sure you google that find that if you can get some tickets definitely recommend you to go so that's number one but yeah really fun night man honestly one of the funnest times i've been to in a while man i really enjoyed it what else do you want to talk about here? Um, oh, the Cybertruck. Oh, my God. Cybertruck, Cybertruck, Cybertruck. I'm sure you guys are aware of the Cybertruck. You're probably tired of hearing about it, but I haven't spoken about it, so I'm going to speak about it right now. Tesla announced the Cybertruck a couple of a few days ago, and it essentially broke the internet. Um, I think what we've seen with Tesla, what we've seen with Elon Musk specifically, is that we've seen an ability. I think every, every sort of release, he seems to get better and better at kind of being able to kind of break the internet and i think a lot of it has to do with which no one's really mentioned i think a lot of it has to do with him being an actual operator because he actually because he's a founder visionary engineer operator designer sort of dude he's actually in touch with people he's on social media a lot especially twitter he loves it he loves the memes i think um I think that kind of approach to things has kind of helped the way they kind of roll out things, the theatrics of everything. I think it honestly has rolled out because if you saw the actual video of the Cybertruck being presented, they kind of rolled up on stage and they had this laser show. They had all these old school sci-fi movie props on the outside, um, outside the actual arena um, of old vehicles from from you know movies that gone by, such as Back to the Future, um, such as a few others i forgot what the other one was called that they had oh i forgot the name but yeah they had quite a few props outside essentially loads of kind of um, futuristic car designs which maybe sort of should have given us a bit more of a hint as to what to expect but when this actual truck rolled out i think it actually took it took everyone by surprise i know it took me by surprise and my initial reaction when i saw it 
was that I fucking hated it, right? I thought this was a. F- uh, I thought at first it was kind of it's gonna be a shell thing that he kind of had, and then suddenly the car sort of transformed, and underneath it was the actual real car, and at the top, top of it was just like a you know a sort of like uh, an LOL sort of like a poke at the internet culture, especially meme culture, especially maybe something like um those games people are playing now online. What's the one with the polygons and shit? I thought it was similar to that. But then the more I looked at it, the more he was talking about the car and the more you just saw it behind him, especially post the glass break, the more I started to like the vehicle. And again, I think as exercise and branding, I think Tesla has done a really good job in terms of, number one, creating a, a very... I think if, 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 if we know anything about the ability to market something, the ability to kind of communicate with customers, if the one thing that we know for certain is that what you have to do is create something very divisive. You have to create something that people either love or hate. One thing that I think most celebrities are aware of, especially um, celebrities that appear, or especially people that are on the come up and maybe appear on you know reality TV programs, you cannot leave your viewers feeling lukewarm about you. People have to feel either very have very strong feelings for you or against you. But if they're lukewarm, you're dead in the water. You have to be able to elicit some kind of emotion, some kind of reaction. And I think that's what Tesla have done with the Cybertruck. They've created something that, it's going to make you either bath when you see it rolling down the street or you're going to turn around in awe and keep following it as it kind of, you know, disappears over the sunrise. Um, it's a fucking amazing vehicle to look at, I think, personally. And I think especially in the, in the avenue of it being a pickup truck, it's obviously something completely different to anything we've seen. And also, it might be a clear indication of where they see themselves going in the future. Because if this is an indication that, okay, now Tesla's maybe, or maybe Elon Musk has basically proved with the Tesla motors that he can design a car that's as beautiful or that is comparably as beautiful as any gas car out there there might be um there might be a feeling within tesla now that they need to push the envelope and really kind of separate themselves from the pack because i think if there's one thing i hated about the um automobile industry even i don't have a car myself one of the annoying things about it especially being a, a pro design graduate um especially having been somebody that was obsessed with sketching and illustrating cars and doing the nice sleek kind of lines and you know understanding proportions and all this sort of amazing things one thing that you discover when you're designing when you're kind of getting into product design you find out all these amazing pro designers out there who are essentially been employed just to create these fantasy these these um fantasy uh vehicles concept cars that never see the light of day whether it's you know because of production, whether it's because of production and manufacturing issues, um, rules and regulations, or whether it may be or because the company thinks the customer's not ready for them yet, it's always annoying when you know those big auto trade shows come around. You see this crazy contraption of a car that looks like something you might see out of Batman, and then by the time it comes, you know, by the time it's a, a ready for the road or ready for manufacture, they've essentially stripped all the goodness and all the fucking craziness out of it and left you with something that you know is a bit of a shell of what you saw previously at the car exhibition and what i like about the cyber truck is that this essentially looks like a concept car but it's going to be available it's good you're going to see this car in two years time driving down the street near you now there might be some tweaks and changes to it there might be some side mirrors some other safety features that we haven't seen beforehand but it, effectively the overall shape of it the overall aesthetic of it is what we're going to see down down the career down the street sometime very soon and i think that is something that's very very admirable and i also think in general it's a big risk right because tesla tesla motor cars or tesla f- car fans have been used to seeing cars of a particular shape a particular sort of design codes and this completely breaks the mold but i think again in the pickup industry if you're gonna if you're gonna differentiate yourself if you're gonna maybe introduce different customers to the pickup you know car range maybe this is the way to do it um i'm not sure if your everyday person that is a workman or work woman who uses the pickup truck day in day out would want to buy something like a cyber truck it might be a car that's specifically aimed at a whole new market of people who want you know something a bit more different just something a novelty car in a collection um they might want they might not want an suv they might want something more akin to this um i would be very very much game for it but i'm a, I'm a fan of it i love the sharp lines i love that there's not a, literally there's no curve on the car whatsoever um i love the stainless steel look of it i'm sure they're going to be other colors of no the elon musk said specifically in the presentation there's no other colors available just the bare metal but they're going to obviously third party uh uh, retailers are going to be offering you know wraps and all that sort of stuff for the car itself but again exoskeleton shell so they're going to be able to manufacture these quite quickly which is quite cool to see and just generally just as that looks of careering around the track that's just an insane car to look at isn't it 
it's such a beast. I think people that were inside of it said that it would look similar to like a Hummer in terms of its size, which is quite cool, right? Um, in terms of its overall size and capacity. I love the fact that they brought the little ATV on board as well to kind of ride up in the back. I actually quite like the back of it. Um, the actual slide, you know, the kind of sort of grill that kind of covers it. I actually like that kind of being retracted. I think it looks more interesting. Um, I like the fact that you can kind of take out the bottom like that. You know, the kind of pickup bit at the back. I actually like it when the thing is down. I think it looks pretty cool. Um, and the lights too still work once you put the flap down. That's pretty amazing. So that means the lights are not connected all the way around it, which is flipping amazing. It's got a ramp on the back of it too. Obviously, you can attach things and tow it along. It's just an amazing, an amazing looking vehicle. That's the, And the ATV, we didn't hear that much about it, but I'm pretty interested to see what happens with that. Whether or not we're going to see Tesla introduce um, a, a motorcycle maybe further down the line, maybe an electric bicycle we haven't seen from them coming up very, very soon. That, that would absolutely kill it. If the Tesla was able to make an electric bike, right, and price it, I don't know, $200, $300, it would sell out. It would be the most popular bike we'd see out without a shadow of a doubt. They could easily make an entry, entry level electric bike or an e-scooter and it would be the pop, most popular thing out. Definitely, 100%. I'm pretty sure, I'm surprised that we haven't seen that from them actually. Maybe again, it's, it's about, maybe the reason why they haven't done that is because they want to achieve, you know, it's better to maybe sell things that are more expensive, sell less of them, make more money and then invest that money back into, you know, lower price, lower ticket items and stuff. But that will be really cool to see. I would love to see that coming up very, very soon. And again, it's available on pre-sale now. So on pre-order, you can pre-order one for as little as $100, which means tons of people have went out and kind of pre-ordered it. I think there's been like 200,000 plus uh, pre-orders now and probably rising. So definitely expect to see more of that coming up very, very soon from Tesla. And just again, an amazing vehicle, man. An amazing presentation and just a, a really cool way to, to kind of essentially blow the entire pickup industry up into pieces and actually bring attention to this idea, like I mentioned before, that, you know, car design has been stagnant for so long you know uh, a lot of it is annoying especially seeing that you know if we watch some of those sci-fi movies or even stuff like the jetsons and stuff you know we had very uh heady views of what the future would look like and essentially we've still got the same form factor we've still got the same kind of mechanics running the same kind of uh cars or automobiles out down the road to so just have tesla put out something that looks like this that's that's going to be road legal is just super 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 inspiring and if anything, it should be a, a another kind of sign or another kind of um, indication to other companies out there that you need to try more, man. You need to kind of go for it and not be afraid to kind of make a difference, make a bit of a splash and kind of challenge your customer. We've had enough of the kind of, you know, basic samey, samey, samey thing. We want something a bit different. If there's one slight I have against the Cybertruck, I wish they would have gone to a really prominent graphic designer also a graffiti artist to make the actual font of the Cybertruck I think the font looks terrible I think I could have done something like that or better in two seconds it would have been nice if they went to an actual you know pretty famous um, graffiti uh, writer of some regard who had a really good throw up and who could kind of do a really good one um, that would look really amazing but you know they're, those are like tiny things that they could probably correct later on down the line it's due to be on the road, I think, 2021, right? They said 2022, so maybe two years down the line. But this is probably the most anticipated I, uh, car I've seen in a while. I've seen maybe, I don't know, six or seven videos from various YouTubers um, basically detailing their experience with the car, which is, again, another masterstroke from Tesla, the ability to kind of invite every YouTuber under the sun who has maybe 100 subscribers plus to the event. Um, they came down and they absolutely, you know, they 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 covered the car from top to bottom. Everyone had a different perspective behind it. Everyone had a different impression. Loads of uh, post um, Tesla Cybertruck event videos. Loads of videos during. Loads of pre, uh, loads of pre, during, post. Loads of roundup stuff. Loads of views of questions. They've generated Tesla been able to generate so much content from this one event. It's just insane to see, really, um, which is another great um, thing that I'm probably going to take as a learning from my marketing stuff that I do whenever I'm, I'm at work and stuff. Just an amazing car, an amazing approach to things, and just cool nonetheless. Um, I can't wait to see it on the road. And again, something to look forward to for my own self, actually, in terms of a car that I would like to get in the future. I've always been a big fan of Teslas. I've always wanted to get a Tesla myself. And imagine your first car being a Cybertruck, like how cool that would be rocking up to school. In a, in a cyber truck and picking up your friends that would be so amazing isn't it <laughs> but yeah re recommend you check it out loads of cool videos out there of it um careering down the street it's really funny seeing the video of it um or interesting of the video seeing of it kind of careering down the street from the side where people are not in it 
you just hear the sound of it the electric sound like how fast it goes like the acceleration is just insane i think it's like 2.9 seconds in 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds or something stupid like that really amazing car really amazing. check it out super 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 cool moving on let's blow my nose first because this hay fever is absolutely killing me as per usual always nice to have a bit of hay fever always nice always nice it never ends really and it these sinus issues never ever end never ever end you think it's gonna end you get you get some um inhalers you think it's gonna be all right nah not really so let's continue hold on bloody hell sorry about that guys okay let's continue on and see what else i've got to talk about here Love stuff to rattle through Ooh, bloody hell okay number number or well not number but a different topic to kind of get into right now let's go here summer walker ah man we talk about this lady basic every week isn't it she's always in the news she's always find a way to kind of get herself in the headline which is a which is a good thing really isn't it in 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 the long and the short of it um for a new artist like herself to have such a stellar debut album you know to go through all the controversies she's gone through um in public and also a command this amount of press is probably a good thing probably for her it isn't personally you know she if she is suffering from social anxiety having her name appear in you know tons of mentions and google threads and no twitter thread sorry and to see herself trending on google trends all the time it probably can get a bit annoying to see people pop up in your comments and talk wild it could probably be quite frustrating but i think for the fans it's quite interesting to see how much attention she kind of garners and um, none more so than this latest debacle that involved her concert in Toronto. So, our Summer Walker was supposed to be booked to do a show in Toronto. She had been billing it up as a monumental occasion. She really looked forward to going to Toronto, meeting all her old friends, and just kind of com connecting with her fan base. You know, for once, she kind of seemed very much up for it. Because if you followed the whole Summer Walker controversy over the last couple of months, or whatever it may be, especially for her live shows, you'd know that she's been... Uh, she's had a very uh conflict a very confusing relationship with her audience right she seems like at one minute she seems very grateful to finally be you know singing in front of hundreds and thousands or thousands of people in sold out arenas and the next time she feels very anxious and very afraid as to what that actually means because i think there is something to be said for even pe most people especially your average everyday person sometimes does it themselves i know i've done it to myself in the past and other jobs i've had you can sometimes self-sabotage because you know what because you're afraid of just what excellence might bring you're afraid if you're if you actually stick to what you're doing now you actually do a good job you could potentially you know change your life forever and you're not necessarily ready for that because you know it's going to bring about you know changing your, your fortunes of your life and having more responsibilities will effectively change the what you do in your every day every your average day to day right you might require you to work later you might have to kind of cut back on the holidays cut back on the drinking cut back on the going out there are things that might have to change in your life and i think sometimes we do, we inevitably self-sabotage ourselves because we don't want to achieve greatness because greatness comes with a lot of respons responsibility that not a lot of people want which is fine and dandy but i think in some ways it's quite annoying because i think most people go into things naively wanting that kind of level of fame like imagine if you go into music or something you essentially might have your hero might be someone like a prince or michael jackson but then you're unaware as to what goes into being prince and michael jackson day in day out you're unaware of the sacrifices that come with that kind of role you're unaware of what you have to do the things you have to subject yourself to the place you have to subject yourself around the people you have to surround yourself with you have to put up with a lot more bs than you kind of are a probably aware of when you're first starting out and i think it's quite annoying to see it nowadays for me in real time with these new songstresses because for the most part most of these girls these songstress like you know ari nillin like summer walker number one they have their they have their you know their internal struggle that they're going through they're striving for greatness but they're very much unaware as to what you know what that level of greatness requires from them but then on the other hand, they're also very forthright in expressing their opinions every single minute of the day on social media. And for me as a fan of music, for me as a fan of just artists in general, it gets a bit tiring to actually see these people, you know, with a selfie, sorry, uh, filming themselves again on the video on Instagram Live and ranting and raving to their fans about why life is so hard whilst they, you know, sit on their, you know, silk sheets, 
after just selling out an, an arena tour somewhere. It's just hard to kind of swallow as a fan because by and large, you kind of want them to kind of be giving you updates on their music, collaborations, what they're thinking about the industry as a whole. But complaining about shows and expectations is just like tiring. But I kind of have some sympathy for Summer Walker in this occasion, but I never signed again. I think she's kind of wilding as per usual. So it's an article from Billboard. It's the headline reads the following. Summer Walker responds to fan criticism over a delayed Toronto concert. So, fans are criticizing Summer Walker for repeatedly, reportedly delaying her Monday night concert for more than three hours. Concert goers took to social media uh, to voice their displeasure um, with the singer who recently cut back on North America tour due to struggles with social anxiety, right? She also canceled a bunch of dates because, you know, supposedly she's socially anxious. I've never in my own life met a socially anxious stripper, but, you know, former stripper, sorry, but that, that's, that's entirely possible nowadays. Would you be... Are you allowed to say? Are you allowed to say you don't believe that? Are you allowed to say you're a bit skeptical about it? I think all these self diagnoses are a bit annoying, right? Everyone suffering from mental health issues is annoying too because everyone's self diagnosing. No one's actually going to a professional, actually, you know, getting a, an actual diagnosis from a, a medical professional for some reason. People want to use medical terms, but they don't really prescribe them or prescribe themselves to medical um, examination. It is what it is. But I think that's a bit weird. Is this, would it be similar to saying, would you believe someone if they told you I'm a socially anxious porn star? Is that entirely possible? Maybe there is because in, in the porn's probably a bad example because there are there has been there has been occasions of there has been quite a few instances of porn stars, especially women who've kind of you know had drug overdoses and suffered things because of you know bullying online and stuff. So that could be possible, but I just don't know, man. I don't know if I buy that. It's just a bit weird to kind of be socially anxious but then always be around people when you're on social media it's just weird she's always on instagram lives twerking and shit doing things that not on, and so when i think of socially anxious i think of someone like party next door he hardly posts online he doesn't really communicate with his fans if ever bryson tiller's another one um they i would imagine they'd be quite awkward when you make them meet them in real life um they wouldn't be the most largest larger than life person ever maybe unless they hit the stage but I don't know, man. Maybe it's again. Maybe it's not my place to say. But I don't know. I I have my reservations. So some fans angered. Uh, some angered fans cite braving the frigid Toronto temperatures while seeing Walker post photos hanging out with Drake and London on the track early in the night. Drizzy hopped on a remix for the R and B artist breakout hit single "Girls Need Love" back in February. Now that's the one bit that I had in the, I had a bit of an annoyance with. I think for the most part, I think if you're a fan of Summer Walker and you're ready to stay outside in a freezing Toronto cold for three hours, you deserve all the props in the world, right? But if you're a fan, you're going to stay. If I bought a ticket to see Summer Walker, I'll probably stay too, right? There's no there's no point in leaving now. If I wait for one hour, I might as well wait two. If I wait two, I might as well wait three. Um, if you just don't want to wait, you go home and you just go home, innit? And just continue doing your thing. Give a ticket to somebody else, let them go inside. No problem with that whatsoever. But I think the thing that's annoying, the thing that kind of rubbed me up the wrong way if I was a fan, is if I was standing in line waiting for her to perform, and I'm seeing all these pictures on, on, on her Instagram of her hanging out with all her favorite artists and friends. Like, that is a bit rubbing your fans' nose in it, for the most part. And I think that's the way the disconnect comes, I think, from some of these artists nowadays. Especially some of the younger ones. They don't seem to... They seem to take their fans for granted. They don't seem to really take... They seem to take the piss with their fans. They don't seem to really care um, how their fans feel about certain things. They seem to just to be like, you know what? This is what I'm doing. I'm doing it. I don't care. There's no real kind of... Um, I don't know how to describe it, man. There's no real... Hmm, how do you say it? Not empathy, but... Well, maybe it's empathy, right? With, the, with their fan position. They're not... Sent, like, would your favourite pop star do that? Probably not, right? They probably... You know, let's think of somebody corny, like a Ariana Grande or like a Taylor Swift or something. What would they be doing if they had to make their fans wait for three hours? They'd be on Instagram live. They'd be posting videos of them running around the backstage, trying to fix, trying to pretend like they're fixing the sound, mucking around the cables. There'd be pictures of them on, on, you know, on the phone, seemingly talking to somebody that we don't mean imaginary or maybe a tour manager or something, trying to sort the situation out. They'd be doing some things to, to kind of alleviate, alleviate their fans. And to, also, they'd be worried that their fans would just leave, right? Because I think even if you're sold out an arena tour, you still want your fans to be there. Because I'm pretty sure you get the money anyway, right? If, if you're sold out, if no one turns up in a day. Imagine if there's a hurricane, no one turned up. You still get paid, right? I'm assuming because the show essentially did sell out. But you still wouldn't want to perform in front of, you know, 10 people. You want a lot of people to be there. So I think that's probably where I'm a bit miffed by. It. It's like there was no worry in her campsite that 
the fans were just going to leave and she wasn't going to perform in front of anyone. They just assumed everyone would just hang around for her to wait, which they did anyway. But that kind of level of arrogance is a bit... <sighs> anyway, let's continue. Um, one attendee re- relayed that Walker finally hit the stage shortly after 11 p.m. Jesus Christ. And performed under and performed just under an hour, which made for quite the underwhelming experience. Walker, Sam Walker is corny. Mental health and social anxiety is one thing, but having your fans wait in the cold while you stroll around Toronto posting is wild and professional. The over it singer told Toronto fans to be prepared for a chill vibe, but didn't warn them about the sort of delay of the recent concert in a since deleted post social media. If y'all want to see me do two splits and a backflip and then the Dale belt and one pussy pop, this show is not for you. Just this, this for wine sippers, blunt rollers and hand swears, she wrote. Which again is a bit annoying, you know, this idea that, you know, describe with these these new artists it's just frustrating and this is my annoyings i had with the fans booing drake drake is your show frank hardly appears and just walks side to side and you guys are siding with the frank thing i don't know what it is maybe it's the idea that the more punished the more punishment you have to endure under an artist the more you love them the more they don't love you the more that you're chasing after them probably that respect that and because drake is so fan um fan centric He's so willing to kind of do anything for the fans. He kind of loves his supporters. He's always listening to them, always trying to give them what they want and challenge them on what they want. There's that kind of to and fro communication. Maybe the people just take it for granted. The fact that you can communicate with him. He sometimes replies back to you in the comments and stuff, right? He gets to people's DMs and gives them words of encouragement. He's like a cool dude, personable guy, even for the level of popularity that he is. But I think maybe because some of these artists are so inaccessible, right? Summer Walker, Frank Ocean, they're just like, you know, they just they just put out, they just talk. It's like talking to a one-way mirror. They don't have, there's no communication back. They're just talking at you. Maybe with fans, they're like, you know what? I want to be their friend so badly because I want to be that one person that can maybe, you know, um, crack through the veneer and kind of really get to know them personally. But that's never going to happen. They're never going to be your friends, you know? It's just this level of, like, disrespect to fans is just wild. And again, the three-hour wait is not that big of a deal in, in, in context, really. If you're able to explain it, well, I think the reason, the rationale I've heard now is that supposedly her equipment got held up at customs which is you know insane because it means that she arrived on the day of the concert didn't arrive the day before arrived like a few hours before the concert started and then that's when you know it's just that's just another story another day it's like you didn't prepare beforehand you didn't bring the i don't know i don't know let's continue um so she read on instagram she went on Instagram Live to say, y'all don't even know what goes on behind the scenes. I had to fire my sound team twice. I don't know why that why that concerns us. I don't know. Um, I couldn't find my passport. Again, why that concerns us, we don't know. A birth certificate. And I had to be up at 5 a.m. to do two different offices to get to my new passport and birth certificate. Babe, you're a pop star. This is what happens. You're a pop star. You're like a, an R&B icon, a legend closely approaching. This is what you have to do. This is part of actually being at the top of your... Um, um, at the top of your respective music genre. This is what it requires. It requires you sometimes having to like fly, you know, throughout the night, not have any sleep, grab a cup of coffee, do some press, go on the stage show, perform, jump off the stage show, do some more press, fly back to your home state, recall something. This is what it happens when you're at the top of the, the apex of the mountain. What do you expect? Somehow she expects to be, have the fans of Mary Carey, but do the work of somebody that's performing to a SoundCloud audience where you can just rock up to a club, play your songs on an MP3 and then bounce. No, you're gonna have to do more than that. You can't have R and B level of fandom, R and B level of hysteria. I mean, Mary Carey level of hysteria and fandom, but then approach it like you're approaching some, you know, show at, uh, I don't know, at like some, you know, 500 capacity um, arena somewhere. I mean, a club, whatever it may be. You have to come with it in a different professional manner, and this is just wild. Like again, as her as an artist, I'm all for it. Do your thing. I think now is the best era to be an artist. Now you can get away with this, right? Fans, for the most part, don't care if you're drugged up on stage, um, leaned out, you know, super high, you can't even sing, drunk. Um, the more crazy and, you know, wild you are, the more the fans tend to like you, you know? I saw a video recently, I post Malone walking, you know, off the stage and randomly, you know, t- having a, taking a beer from some random stranger in the crowd, which is wild, but people do that sometimes, right? But the more rack wild you are in that way, the more people tend to like you. That's fine. But the, for the fans, how can you be a... How is it... How can you rationalize being a Stem Walker fan when she, you know, treats you with such disdain and doesn't want to inform you and tells you the day of, oh, I lost my passport, oh, my birth certificate, oh, I had to get up at 5 a.m., oh, this, all oh, that. Like, how is that even... It's just insane, man. Anyway. 
Um, to an offices. By the time I got to Toronto, all I had time to do was to check in. Oh, sorry about that. Um, wash my hair and get to the venue. I didn't even know I was motherfucking late. I got on stage, and when I told and when I when I'm told to go on stage, Drake told me he was going to come to my show. I told him not to come because I suck. He comes, very grateful, nice man. He was extremely sweet. The thing is, we only spoke for two minutes. Him, Meek, and some other niggas walked in. We say hello. I take a picture. We probably exchange about two sentences, and then he said, "Summer, it's time to go on stage." I didn't. I did what I was supposed to do. If I'd known my fuckers were waiting four hours, I would have apologized. So why don't you apologize now then? I don't get this. I don't get this. If she would like again, this 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 woman is insane, bro. She's uh, how she has fans. I just don't know. And these are some excellent memes. Obviously, some posts of her uh, backstage with the boys. Some walker is really on a field trip with her fans in Toronto after game hyperthermia. You hate to see it. <laughs> Summer Walker had her fans wait three hours in the cold while she went and toured Toronto with Drake. Man, this Summer Walker girl is another. She's, she's another level. Again, I don't know what it is about these new artists. Again, you know what's going to be funny to see? How does she react when she starts to lose fans and no one starts to care about her album? It's not going to happen probably because I think she's. I think this is an example that we see in sports, even with someone like a Neymar. If you're that le- if you're that talented, people will just have people will just put up with whatever they have to put up with because you can change games. It, Neymar did it the other day against Real Madrid he came on he essentially played DM or CM and completely changed the game inspired PSG to a 2-2 draw nearly got them a 2-2 what 3-2 win if uh, Mbappe would have pulled the ball back you know top top players do top level stuff but they have to they come with a lot of baggage and I think songstresses rappers uh, singers in general these are their same thing right I think even sometimes you know diva like enigmatic um, lead singers in bands are the same way if you're that level of talent you're just going to come with a kooky personality you're going to take the piss you're going to take liberties and people will have to put up with it because you just always deliver on albums and if she does deliver albums and singles which people what the main reason why people rate her it's going to be fine but i think if i was a fan of summer walker i would be super annoyed if i came out of that concert after especially i think most fans that went there probably had a good time but i think after if i left and i would have seen her instagram post and what she wrote on social and her, her instagram video i would have been like what the fuck i would have apologized if i knew i was late that's a mad wild statement to make to your fans, man. Imagine that. Like, I, I don't know. Again, I have no words, man. No words. Um, but yeah, big up Summer Walker for being a legend. She's basically uh, Lauren Hill 2.0. Um, arrives super late. People still wait. She sings her song. People complain. She just keeps it going. Rinse and repeat, it. She's never going to change. Um, but yeah, wow. To be a Summer Walker fan, innit? To be a Summer Walker fan. Bloody hell. Bloody hell. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. What else do we have here? Du, 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 du. Uh, what else do we have here? <laughs> so, oh, so, I'm, so my, I wouldn't say I'm sneezing so much today. My allergies are horrendous. But there's one more, and then I'll have to leave. <laughs> This is getting too much for me. Too much, too much, too much. I apologize. Oh my god, this is so bad. But anyway, let's go. Last one. Um, this is an old topic that I had on my safety for a while, but I thought <laughs> oh, bloody hell man. I think it's these napkins, they're scented probably, so it's making my nose get all messed up. But anyway, let's continue. So this topic from or this article from BBC News. Um, it's titled, funnily enough, I've spent my life. I spent my life in fear of being called fat, which is essentially, I'm assuming some kind of fat positive, uh, body positive message going on here, which, you know, again, I have no, I have no objection to. Um, let's probably read the article and then we can comment to it. Or maybe I'll give my overview. Let me give an overview on what I think of the fat movement um, or the body positive movement. I'm not against it, right? I think for a long period of my life, maybe from the age of like, when I start getting lunch money, probably from the age of 14 to maybe 22, 23, I was morbidly obese, right? I was way up, well, way too fat. I probably was like 20 stone, 260 pounds for my height. It's just insane, right? Now I'm about 220, 219 on a good day. I want to get down to 200 by the end of the year. But I was a really big dude, right? A really fat dude for a long period of my life. And But I still had the same kind of personality I have now. I was still, you know, pretty happy-go-lucky. Uh, but I was quite self I was quite self-aware of how fat I was, 
because I couldn't play sports the way I wanted to do. I couldn't run the way I wanted to run. I couldn't play football the way I wanted to play football. The thing I just couldn't do my body because I knew what was holding me back and it was the weight. And it was annoying, but I just couldn't help myself from eating. Right? I was just kind of a fat dude that didn't tend to kind of like stop eating. Um, obviously, um, I wouldn't say my family is inherently big. We're bigger people, but we're not fat people. So it was obviously something that I kind of had done to myself just through you know, lack of discipline uh, and lack of kind of, you know, um, acknowledgement of kind of what I'm doing to myself and just kind of blaming the outside world for anything. But it did kind of get to a head, especially when I turned 21, when I realized that I was unable to attract the girls that I wanted to attract in my life. And again, it's maybe a very surface level way to look at it. I'm super conceited and a bit, you know, um, self-absorbed and a bit whatever it may be but that was my experience i couldn't number one get the girls i wanted in life and i also couldn't wear the clothes i wanted because I, I was very much into fashion as i am now and it just kind of there was always a bit of a a, uh, a barrier there there's was, there was only so far you could get to there's only so much personality a girl could appreciate in you before she started to look at you a bit yucky there's only so much there's only so many bigger jeans you could wear or baggy clothes you could wear before you started to feel a bit self-conscious so i always felt a bit weird around people or dressed in the stuff that i was dressed in it's just part of my life isn't it so I obviously went for a bit of a change, a bit of a metamorphosis. I kind of went into, I started picked up, picked up running. I, I went deep into CrossFit. I started eating healthy, and all because I wanted to lose the weight and look better in clothes. That was it. There was no other reason I wanted to do that. I wanted to look better in clothes, and that that was it. And I wanted to attract girls. Simple as that. But I have a lot of understanding, and I have a lot of appreciation for the fat movement now because back then, when I was younger, that didn't really exist. It probably doesn't really exist now in the wider scheme of things. But I think for the most part, people would look at you a bit sideways if you took the piss out of somebody when they were fat. When I was younger, taking the piss out of you when you're fat was just part and parcel of the, of the role. Part of the reason why I probably have quite a thick skin now is because I got teased consistently, especially when it was PE, right? And I was, you know, got my top off. People were taking the piss out of me all the time, and it hardens you, right? It makes you have tougher skin. You, um, it kind of improves your ability to kind of rip people as well back because you're having to take it and give it as well every single day. It never, ever ends. If you know anything about boys, the way we connect and the way we kind of uh, build friendship is through kind of that kind of weird conflict, right? We're always kind of teasing, poking each other, fighting each other. And that's how you essentially become really close friends um, through constantly ribbing um, of each other. And I have some of my best friends were people that were, you know, essentially caused me to go and cry in the toilet one day, right? They're some of my best friends because you know, we were able to kind of get past that moment. But I don't know if I would have liked this movement to have been around when I was in school. I don't know if I would have been the person I am now if I had somebody telling me it's okay to be the way that I am. And that's the only issue that I have about the fat movement. I'm okay with telling people that you, not everyone needs to be skinny. I'm okay with understanding that we're all made in different shapes and sizes. But this this kind of weird bit at the end of it, especially towards the, the end of the spectrum of the fat acceptance movement, where they try to persuade you that being that morbidly obese is healthy and there's no you know and there's no in intrinsic health issues that are associated with being that big and carrying amount carrying that amount that amount that amount of weight around with you and also the understanding that if you're that big it usually means you're eating things that you probably shouldn't eat to excess um i don't know that's the thing that i'm not really down with and i think that's where i kind of have no time for the place that I do have a lot of time for, especially, is definitely within the fashion industry. I think for the longest time, I think women have let the fashion industry get away with murder in terms of how they're represented in fashion. I think this idea that all women are, you know, skinny and a particular size is just insane. I think for the most part, the biggest buyers of fashion, especially in the high street, are women of an average or everyday, kind of, not the average body size is probably, I don't know, size 12 and up or whatever it may be. So to kind of have women in size zero on the model shoot or whatever it may be, a, a kind of advertising and marketing these brands is really really reprehensible and for as much as for as much negative is um kind of ascribed to kind of the ma the male uh kingdom and for all the negative they kind of give the patriarchy i think women have done a really really haven't helped situation either by kind of you know perpetuating this idea that women, all women want to have big tits be skinny and have a big ass like all women might want that but not all women can have that and there's a lot of women out there who are more than happy living in the skin that they are and kind of being happy the way they are and kind of all they want to see is being themselves represented in a vogue magazine represented in a billboard and now it's happening more so than often more so it's happening because of pop stars such as uh rihanna such as reality tv stars such as kim kardashian have come in and actually been appealing to the everyday woman which is ironic considering some of these reality tv shows and pop star people where, where the people these brands or these media companies would tell us have no connection with the real woman but they actually do more so than the actual brands which is you know annoying to see but anyway this is an article from bbc 
it's a uh, it's it says the following it's written by a woman called or a person called charlie jones not sure if it's a woman it says the following um megan jane crab was a five years five years old when she started a war with her body instead of making friends with her first instead of, instead of making friends on her first day at school uh, she was comparing herself to her peers and telling herself she was chubby. Now she has more than a million Instagram followers and recently told Parliament that fat phobia should be recognised as a form of prejudice. Now, I don't like the fact that chubby is written in air quotes. I think if you're chubby, you're chubby. We know what... I don't think we need to kind of recontextualise words. We see what we see. Somebody's fat, somebody's skinny is what it is, but we shouldn't be judging people based on their weight. That's fair and fine, but let's not let's not get down the lane of the uh, let's not get let's not get to a place where we're we're suddenly saying air quotes around chubby. Chubby is chubby, skinny is skinny, fit is fit. It is what it is, isn't it? Um, it took Megan almost two decades to accept her body. The years leading up to that were fraught with yo-yo dieting, crippling anxiety, a spell in a residential psychiatric hospital, and at twenty-one, having dropped out of college and then university, she hit her target weight. Still, she hated everything about herself, which again has nothing to do with her or weight has more to do with her where you see herself i think as well when i think i have to say for my journey i mentioned previously that i essentially lost weight because i wanted to get with more girls and i wanted to fit into nicer clothes when, once i did that i realized that that wasn't actually a goal the goal was actually to be fit and healthy right especially since i started to get into the whole um self-actualization route self-development route reading the four-hour work week and going down that whole rabbit hole i started to realize that if i want to have mastery over my finances over my lifestyle over the friends i have around me if i want to cultivate a great peer group if i want to make sure i have the right kind of media coming in at me um audioly visually wherever it may be then I have to also be the master of my body, right? My temple. I have to have that under control too. That's just part of the process. Um, and then that was something that I actually enjoyed. Like I actually enjoy going to the gym. I enjoy kind of subjecting myself to miles and miles of running outside aimlessly. I like doing it. I don't do it specifically because I want to attract people or because I want to fit into clothes. That's a byproduct of it, but I like it because it brings me um, clarity. It kind of helps my kind of mental health. It allows me to kind of think about things. It allows me to kind of meditate on ideas. And it just allows me to have my own little alone time outside of everything else I'm doing on social media. I enjoy it. But to somehow say those um, those kind of activities or leading to depression, I don't think is right. I think maybe what happened internally was kind of aiding and abetting it but i don't know i'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of that idea that you know um you have to go through decades of dieting and running and your diet and to then accept yourself usually it's a fact of like you didn't accept yourself in the beginning and now you accept yourself that's why you're better i would say but anyway it continue i knew that no matter what way i got to she says here it would never be enough megan now is now 26 i can't continue that life i knew there had to be more my eating disorder had taken so much from me i wasted so much of my time and refused to let it take any more somehow I stumbled across an image of a woman on Instagram wearing a bikini and taking, talking about accepting her body, not dieting and living her life as she was. I never really believed that was an option before. Which again, I don't have a problem with. I think accepting for you for who you are is fine. I think there's some, there's a portion of the population that is very much okay with just, you know, clocking in, clocking out, answering to the man, living an everyday life, going on a couple of holidays a year, hanging out with their friends on a Friday night, um, looking after their kids, you know, cleaning the car on a Sunday, you know, picket, white picket fence, two kids and a dog. That's fine. But I don't think those people should be allowed or should be encouraged to judge the people who want more from life, who are always challenging themselves, who, you know, a billion isn't enough. They want two, they want three, they want four. Two bins isn't enough, they want five, they want six. You know, they keep constantly improving. They're trying to learn languages, they're traveling the world, they're working out all the time we shouldn't judge each other i think if you're okay just being a regular schmegular dude or girl that's fine and if you're okay you know consistently um chasing the dragon that's okay too we shouldn't judge each other i think that's what the issue that i have is like one person is then justifying themselves comparing to the you know high achiever person and the high achiever person is looking down on the person's regular schmegular and you know basically questioning their motivation which i also don't think is fair because i don't think everyone is meant to be jeff bezos not everyone's meant to be elon musk some people are meant to be employees they're meant to be the second third fourth fifth ten tenth person in command that's perfectly fine janitors at tesla probably do are probably as important to the whole infrastructure of tesla as a person designing the actual cars those are all okay we all are we all kind of a summer of parts we all kind of help each other out but all this constant pointing the fingers is idiotic and again like i said let's not try and rewrite history let's not try and rewrite science we all can't pretend that being that way or being overweight in general is good for you in the long term 
It isn't. We know it isn't. Sometimes maybe maintaining a certain weight is good for you, but being morbidly obese isn't. We can't say that's healthy. That's insane. It continues. Which and I don't. I think she looks pretty cool to be honest. In my in my uh, in my opinion, and I think again, if I was a girl growing up now, it'd be quite cool to have her as an as an as a, a role model. Somebody somebody that looks like that especially if someone looks similar to the everyday girl because again like i said for the longest time fashion brands have been ignoring girls like this right they were purposely pushing one image and saying that was quote unquote normal or achievable for most people when it isn't most people don't want to do what they what models are doing to kind of look like that it's just what it is isn't it it continues here um long posts of hers on social which i'm not going to read um the article says megan began posting body positive messages and photos on instagram about body f- body posse body posse panda and massing hundreds of thousands of followers she refers to herself as chubby in her post which is cool because she is and wants her followers to embrace this sort of language the word fat used to have a power to knock me out cold i spent my life in fear of being called fat i couldn't even see the world when i found out the body positive movement might as well open to a whole new way of seeing fat it's just over another world a way to describe your body a new a new way to reclaim it now the only thing that i have in terms of i'd say anecdotally which i'd say is probably a bit out of order i've been in numerous trains and buses and i've seen how people react to fat girls especially when they get on the bus it's just i have a lot of sympathy for it because i've been on a train and i've been sitting down and a bigger girl has got on and two people have got up when she sat down immediately because they didn't want to be squashed out they've tried they've essentially tried gone out their way to make her feel uncomfortable i think most guys i've seen on trains are a little bit more savvy and probably don't want to subject themselves to that level of embarrassment and they tend to never sit down and just stand up the whole time um which you can kind of understand they don't want to put anyone out they don't want to also you know embarrass themselves and, and you know be in a mood when they get back home but i've seen some girls just tired and just want to sit down and, and boys or girls have stood up and essentially kind of made a noise or did something and it's been like wow people are so people can be assholes in it and i've seen that myself so i i have sympathy for some of it what she's going through but i don't know man there's a part of me that's like should you be really promoting this as like normality should this be something that should be encouraged or should we be as as much as we be having as much as we should have women that look like this on media in terms of you know showing what real women look like we should still be encouraging people to you know if you can and if you're bothered you should try and lose weight because it's going to help you in the long run that's it not a message of like do it or you'll die or that sort of stuff because that kind of leads into the territory of you know those kind of crazy um evangelical preachers that say all fans to go to hell that's insane but you should be allowed to like you know talk about your message and where you're kind of standing things but you shouldn't be telling people they're going to burn in hell and pushing it down their face that's not on at all but i also think there should be a balance but also then she might kick back and say to me i know this isn't healthy but i want to be this way you don't have a right to keep telling me that I should work out which is perfectly fine um but again i think for the girls coming up it's probably a good thing to have somebody that looks like her and somebody that looks like kylie on your social media feed because it allows you to kind of put things into perspective right one side you've got a multi-billionaire at 22 he probably has all the resources in the world to maintain that level of weight that she has and on the other side you've got an irregular everyday girl like yourself who's smiling the same way kylie is who seems to be enjoying her life the same way kylie is but is doing it in another way another aesthetic and another kind of body type and it's up to you as a person as a viewer scrolling your social media feed to kind of understand where you fall in that kind of lane you know what side you fall on the, on the tracks but yeah I, i'm a fan of her man i'm a fan of her i think she looks cool um i think the whole movement is pretty fine uh, let's continue a little bit more the article and finish it here megan began dieting at 10 and told her parents she wanted to be a uh, healthier but she soon realized it was developing into something harmful by the time she was 14 she was diagnosed with eating disorder and by 20s a hair in her body had taken up as much as brain space she left education and took in a permanent role as a carer of her sister Gemma, who was cerebral palsy she now has described herself as an activist ugh, model and public speaker and has recently compare, completed a UK tour where she sang, danced, and discussed diet culture to combine with 2,000 people. Yeah. There's an audience for it, man. There's an audience for everything, it seems like there. Everyone's got something they're going through. Recently, she was interviewed for Fern Cotton on her podcast, Happy Place. The book has later revealed that chat with Megan had transformed the outlook, telling Elizabeth Days how to full pod, failed podcast that it was a seminal moment for her. I can't tell you how transformative that chat was for me, Fern Cotton said. I was just hanging off her every word and it was been another shift of consciousness for me where I realized how unkind I was still being to myself. I went on a beach holiday afterwards for a week and I usually would hate wearing a bikini and beat myself up about this and that. I just didn't care. It was so wonderful. Um, Megan, who lives in Colchester, Essex, uh, was recently invited to Parliament to talk about the government qualifies 
office. We cannot have a. Uh, anyway, it's a good, it's a good article. I recommend checking. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, she she does she puts on a good show. It looks like um, celebrating girls of every weight. And I'd imagine going to that kind of event would probably fill you loads of confidence. Um, you probably leave it with a glow oak hanging over you. But you know the world is a harsh and dangerous place. The moment you go on the train, the moment you stand on the escalator, the moment you try to find the fitting room, the moment you try to find something to in your size in the shopping center, all of a sudden all those you know um, ideas of yourself come flooding back. All those negative thoughts come flooding back, and it's just annoying, isn't it? That you can't constantly be in this bubble all day round, which is again, which is probably one of the struggles and the challenge of kind of um, navigating this world in general you can't essentially world live in the world that you want you live have to live in a world that actually exists and operate in that regard but yeah big up Gemma man she's a cool is it Gemma or Megan Megan sorry she seems like a cool girl I recommend you check out the article it's called I spent my life in fear of being called fat I'll link in the show so you guys to check out it's really interesting anyway that's it man episode number 259 thanks so much for checking in it's been it's been a pleasure as per usual if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a free a five star review not free star forget the free star if you're watching via youtube give the video a like smash that like button um maybe subscribe to the show too so you can come back and check some other videos i do and as per usual check out everything concerning myself on my website agostinozinga.com that's agostinozinga.com show will be in the description below uh, check that out and i'll see you guys again very very soon peace take care bye